welcome to our latest installment of The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. My name is Greg Carr and I'm honored to serve as the uh, host every week. And this week uh, we are having a, a conversation with uh, one of our great scholars, warriors, organizers, a man that Cornel West has called uh, the towering radical theorist of American democracy of his generation. Uh, and in this case, I would fully agree. Uh, this brother that we're about to hear from, Professor Adolph Reed, is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, that was his latest stop in a long career. He's taught at the New School. He's taught at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Northwestern, Yale, and at Howard University, among other places. He's won a number of awards uh, as the publisher uh, and, and has published seven books, um, and several of them I keep near me, uh, Stearns in the Jug, W.B. Du Bois, American Political Thought, Class Notes. Uh, those Two of those are collections of his essays. He wrote one of the first books on Jesse Jackson, if not the first. We'll ask him in a second in terms of his political campaigns. And equally, if not more importantly, he is an organizer, an activist. Uh, we've talked over the following few weeks and to Robert Smith and Abdullah Kalamat. Well, uh, like them, uh, Adolf Reed has been in the trenches and grappling with the real issues that will help us transform our society. His latest book, the book we'll be discussing today, is The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. He is a Southerner, New Orleansian, although he's got roots in Arkansas, has spent time in Georgia, North Carolina, many other places. And we're going to talk about all that and more now with uh, our guest here at the Black Table, Professor Adolph Reed Jr. Welcome, Professor Reed. How are you? Oh, good. Uh, yeah, good, brother. Thanks a lot for having me, man. I appreciate it. And I thought I saw um, st stirrings in the jug on the shelf behind you, but I didn't want to be too arrogant. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, man. Look, I didn't realize, uh, and of course, you mentioned your, your dear friend and another great force who we lost too soon, um, uh, Joe Wood. Yeah. And, and it took it took. You know, it took him two years to coax you into writing What Are the Drums Saying Book? I remember yep. reading that in the village boy, and no shots fired still reverberate, brother. <laughs> you can't feel stung by that, man. <laughs> I'm glad Cornell got over it. <laughs> hey, man, like I've got so much respect for that brother, man. I mean, like we have worked very closely together, uh, um, especially through the two Sanders campaigns, and he's like a stalwart comrade and 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 more than what well, one of the most important things I think I can say about anybody is that he's clearly politically serious. Uh, and there are fewer and fewer of those folks out there. Right. Even when they think they are, they aren't. So I, they, it, it's funny. I had planned on asking you this later, but actually, since in the flow of conversation, it works for quite well. Um, the young cat that wrote the profile, uh, a bit of a profile on you and a bit of a review on the book in The New Yorker in January. Uh, yeah. I, you know, he quoted Cornell as saying that you have these great uh, contempts for structural inequality and hypercapitalism and how these things operate. And people misinterpret, perhaps, sometimes your very keen and precise, really, uh, critique of how race operates in this society. I think about, of course, your, your colleague, Barbara Fields, who wrote the, the foreword mm -hmm. to the South. Um, but make no mistake about it. You detest inequality in all its forms, particularly these structural inequalities. And right. it seems to me, I guess, the first question I would ask before we get to the book. Well, I guess it is, actually dovetails with the book. Mm -hmm. where, where does that come from? You come from a long line of, of folks who have pushed against barriers. And we were talking about your father and your yeah. mother as well. But please say, say something about your origins. Well, yeah, it's funny, man. I mean, like uh, uh, what one of my personal mantras, maybe my personal motto is uh, is that it's often, most often, better to be in the right place at the right time to pay attention than it is to be smart, right? Uh, and that's the response that I have whenever somebody says I'm, you know, I was prescient for observing Obama and the way I observed him. I was just there, right? I was in the birthing room at the outset of his political career, so to speak, and was involved in the controversy. So, but, but I say that to say, well, you know, back when I was a youngster, uh, uh, I mean, as you know, there was a certain cachet that attached to the to the persona of the red diaper baby back in the 60s. Yes. But I always felt like I just inherited the family business. Right. I mean, because <laughs> uh, my dad, right, was uh, w was immersed in and came out of that sort of black popular front leftism uh, um, from, from the 30s and 40s. 
And his father in like Southeast Arkansas was actually a Debs voter and a socialist. And Gene Debs. Yep. So, and I think like there was like a handful of Debs voters in Arkansas in a 1912 election. And his father was one of them, and Orville Faubus' fa father was another. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you're really disrupting narratives at this point. <laughs> this, this is before Moore versus Dempsey. I think about all my. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. These cats want to talk about Scipio Jones and them boys. He's like, no, nah, race is not that easily red. You have to read right. against class. Fascinating. Yeah. So you did inherit the, the family business. And, and, and you, uh, I asked you before we started about not only your, your father's work, but mm -hmm. you know, the impact of that generation of historically black college right. professors, uh, particularly right. political scientists. Who, right. uh, could you talk uh, yeah. about yeah. Uh, yeah, well, the Southern University in particular, right, in the late 50s and, and the beginning of the 60s, they had a really... Uh, extraordinary complement of faculty like in history and political science the two departments were combined hmm. um and that's one of the reasons that you know atlanta university where i went to graduate school was uh was um um i wouldn't say dominated but there was a prominent uh line uh, among the faculty and the students that came through southern right uh hmm. mac mac jones the department chair yeah uh, um, is it is also from Southwest Louisiana and and was expelled from Southern in 1960 in the student demonstrations, wow. and went to Texas Southern. Uh, Alex w Willingham up uh, was from Shreveport, went to Southern. What when he finished his PhD, went back and taught at Southern, and then came to AU. And those are the people who recruited me to go to AU, right? And Shelby Lewis. Uh, it's from Plain Dealings, Louisiana, up there, not too, you know, someplace between uh, you near know, Shreveport and, and uh, Ruston. Uh, and she taught at Southern, and or she went to Southern, and she came, came and 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 and, and uh, she taught African politics at AU. And we had a bunch of students, right? I mean, uh, my my closest comrade in uh, like every student class for several years had somebody like like me in it, at least one such person who had come back to graduate school from having been out organizing, right? Yes. Um, and my, uh, you know, one of my closest comrades, I'd really say my closest comrade in the graduate program is my homeboy, who who also happens to be from New Orleans, Earl, Earl Picard, uh, who, uh, you know, who was a year after me. And we all, so for a while there, uh, um, the leadership of the Atlanta chapter of the African Liberation Support Committee was made up uh, concentrated largely among a group of people who were graduate students in the AU political science program. And, and in fact, one especially telling moment was uh, we, uh, uh, several of us were enrolled in, in a Marxist theory seminar that Alex taught in the fall of 1973. It was my second year and Earl's first. And as the semester began, we were confronted with the coup against the Allende government in Chile. And this was at the same time that we were struggling for a left position uh, within uh, you know, the Atlanta ALSC chapter and coming up on the 1973 mayoral, uh, mayor, mayoral election in Atlanta, which would produce uh, you know, Maynard Jackson, the city's first black mayor. So it was like a, I mean, once again, I go back to the motto, right? It, 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 it was uh, quite important for me to be in the right place at the right time and pay attention. That is that, that's remarkable. And, and we actually, as I said, we talked to uh, to Abdul, Professor Kalamai. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his new book on the literary support committee is out now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you managed to pack all this in 140 plus pages. <laughs> in this book. But I mean, I mean, there are references to the Republic of New Africa, to the Garvey right. movement. And right. you actually, you know, having lived uh through that mo those moments in the 60s and 70s coming of age intellectually mm -hmm. uh, and, and being involved you have a unique perspective and maybe and we'll get more into this in in the next segment but the book which i think you of course rightly bristle at calling it a memoir but you do thank use, you brother <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you do use your life right as a southerner who right is well traveled and circle through these movements to kind of give unique perspective. Could you give us a sense 
of what it was like growing up in New Orleans. And we'll come back after the break and talk about this much mm-hmm. more. But, but you didn't just grow up in New Orleans, huh? You New Yorker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and so in a way, I think all that kind of helped because like, uh, yeah, I mean, moving around a lot wasn't fun at the time as a kid, of course. But 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 I realized like in retrospect, like not 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 having come up in any one one place like uh, you know, the rules of the game, right, of hierarchy and exploitation were never really second nature. I was always kind of learning uh, right what the local options were. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, as you well know, like the circumstances that you grow up in are always going to be somewhat like nature. I mean, for instance, somebody asked me in another interview uh, not that long ago whether – you know, you know, there's an incident that I mentioned in in the book uh, where my grandmother, like when I was a little kid, I used to love to ride the Algiers Ferry back and forth across the river. And my grandmother and I were on it one day. I was like five, six, seven, something like that. And uh, we sat close to the dividing line, the Jim Crow dividing line on the ferry. And I asked her, you know, what you know, what was up with the chicken wire? And she said in the stage whisper, well, a lot of crazy people ride the ferry. And they have to sit on the other side of the chicken wire. So, you know, that made sense to me. And I was glad that they had to sit over there. But somebody asked me, uh, you know, not that long ago, if, if I noticed that all the people on the other side of the chicken wire were white. And fact is, no, I didn't. Right. I just knew they were crazy people. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. You know, it, it's so funny because even as, as you open the text, man, the way that not only your grandmother and your family, but black folk in the black community and the way that you, uh, you know, dissemble this, disassemble rather, this Mm -hmm. note that race is somehow real, but rather it's socially constructed. The way that y'all navigated those lines, not only did it feel familiar to me as someone born and raised in Tennessee, who's in that generation that comes after you all, it's kind of received that kind of, you know, our parents grew up in in, in the lost cause mentality South, Mm -hmm. but it was very familiar because it's not, that simple as black and white right you know, was it was this the same grandmother y'all sent in to get the beignets man it's absolutely she, <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean it's i mean and any southerner understands what you were writing there it's yeah. not just black and white oh good i hope so yeah i definitely hope so yeah right. if, if, if when we come back we're gonna take a mm-hmm. minute pause and when we come back we actually are going to go right to your book the okay. south and and we can talk more and really get into this whole complexities of race and class uh, through the lens of someone who is in a generation uh, which is in many ways the last generation to have directly experienced uh, that form of American apartheid we call Jim Crow. So back with the uh, Black Table in a moment. I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Back at the Black Table with Professor Adolph Reed, Professor Emeritus, University of Pennsylvania, and author of the new book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. When we left, we were right on the verge of beginning to plumb uh, the depths of this book. Uh, In the first chapter, Quotidian Life in the 1950s and 60s, and chapter two, The Order in Flux and Being in Flux within the Order. Prof, help us understand what you mean when you help us understand. Well, you say two things. One, you're in that mm-hmm. generation, of course, uh, who uh, experienced Jim Crow. And he, you say it's the last generation. And by the way, I'm glad that y'all are long lived. Your mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. Man. <laughs> but I mean, you know, help us understand in a world where we often see too many times things as black and white in terms of race. Right. Right. What those complexities look like growing up for you and, and traveling around? Well, yeah. Uh, uh, th- yeah, it's, well, it's kind of hard to do it like in a nutshell, because like I said, I mean, the 
Well, uh, when you're experiencing it, like it's just life, right? Yes. So it's only, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, right, that you can begin like to order it, right, uh, right into categories. Um, but and I mean, like if you come up with the understanding of a hierarchy, then the hierarchy is like nature. And but but people also kind of look for, you know, dignity and decency and security in their lives, no matter what. But 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 I think one of the differences now that that doesn't help us and and I know that this person is like going to be just probably tired of my using this anecdote. But a couple of years before I retired, um, I did a course, a, a, a grad seminar on black American political thought. And it was really more of a reading course or a bibliographical course than it was a research course. So the readings were impossibly heavy. And um, students led uh, uh, discussions every week about uh, you know that week's readings. And this one student who was a first year student in in political philosophy, who whose whose background wasn't part of this stuff at all, led the discussion of uh, of a mass of readings from the mid 30s to the late 40s and people like Ralph Bunch, Oliver Cox, mm -hmm. uh, what um, a big chunk of, uh, of the Rayford Logan's um, collection, what the Negro wants, a bunch of other stuff, articles from the Journal of Negro Education, a lot of other stuff. And she began by saying, you know, the, the thing that really surprised me about all these readings was nobody actually talked about the need to fight racism. They all talked about, you know, specific policies and proposals that we needed to fight for and ones that we needed to fight against. But nobody was talking about fighting an abstraction called racism. Hmm. And one of the things that's happened to us since Really, I think since um, um, in, in the aftermath of the Voting Rights Act and with the sort of uh, change in black American politics since then, uh, is that uh, uh, the way we think about and talk about politics has has moved farther and farther away from concrete objectives and issues and policies and more and more to abstractions like racism white supremacy or, you know, trans historical anti-blackness or whatever. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, uh, and I mean, I often like in, invoke like the, uh, uh, I mean, the metaphor of an aerial photo lens, right? So like the higher you, you, you pull the lens up right into the air, the more everything on the ground looks the same, mm. right? But, but, but the closer you come to earth, the more able you are to see the distinctions, right? The, yes. About the mountains, the valleys, the deserts, right? Whatever. Yes. And to the extent that our ways of think, the dominant ways of thinking and talking about politics among black Americans have climbed up to that level of abstraction that they've climbed up to, then it does create a picture in which everything seem, seems the same. Nothing has changed, right? Because insofar as racism is an attitude, well, the attitude uh, is going to be around, right? Yes. Uh, and that helps, I think, to make sense of the manifestly uh, wrongheaded or problematic notion that nothing has changed for black people since, you know, 1965, 1865, 1765, 1619. Yeah. Right. Uh, when when. When it's patently obvious, most directly uh, in the biographies and occupations of the people making the charge, that a whole lot of stuff has changed and has changed pretty radically. So, so, so I guess I should apologize, man, because I think uh, I might have taken us uh, on on a, on a, what my grandmother used to describe as going all all around Robin Hood's barn. And, <laughs> And I'm not, not sure that I answered no, no, your question no, 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 not at all. Not at all, Prof. Okay. Actually, that's, that's actually very good. And I'm glad because one of the things we're doing here is exposing folks to things they might not hear uh, mm. in other venues. And one by evoking those Black writers in particular from the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, shout out to Charles Thompson, the editor, and all those folks at the Journal of Negro Education, of course, yeah. those just, right. just exquisite work, as you know better than I do. It raises two questions that really emerge that are, are teased through in the book. 
one, when you say se separate was never intended to be equal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those who might romanticize and say, you know, well, we had to get, I remember the conversation you had with the, with the white patron y'all in the hotel where you wouldn't have gone <laughs> in before, and he's talking about the good old days and he's like, right. I'm not going to say anything. I just want to get my po boys. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other end of the spectrum, which is fascinating, you say that, you know, oppressed people know it. So yeah. the idea of devaluing the poor, and I guess in, in, in what you've just laid out for us, some of those things kind of converge. They might not have written about race overtly, Oliver Cox, another HBCU towering mm -hmm. figure, of course, uh, Ralph Bunch and, and mm -hmm. all, all of those folks. At the same time, I wonder, the folks who say perhaps that nothing has changed or that things that have changed haven't made that big of a difference. D how do you think about the power of black institutions during uh, this period of Jim Crow, realizing, as you say in the book, Mm -hmm. That one of the things segregation did was prevent the fully the full maturation of that kind of class stratification that since 1965, we've seen just kind of just really right. jump. Right. But, you know, it maybe is part of this assertion that things haven't changed as a result of folks who find themselves in different institutional formations or class arrangements than mm -hmm. their predecessors. I don't know. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's an interesting question, too. Like, I wonder about that. Um, you know, sometimes like an autobiographical way, like if I'd gone got, gone to school someplace else, right, with the opportunity structures that were opening, like if I would have been, you know, John McWhorter's daddy or something like that, right? Right. But, right. That, but I don't that, know. That, that, right. I had Atlanta University man with Mac Jones and them. In fact, we just talked to Robert Smith, who just did. Oh yeah, um, right. I yeah. hey, yep. I mean, I'm trying to imagine what that would look like now. Well, see, I tell you something else about that though, too. <laughs> like. As important as AU was for me, UNC Chapel Hill was just as important, right? And I saw you dedicated it to Earl Indris Thorpe, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Earl Thorpe, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's a name we don't hear much. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and, uh, and and he was a longtime family friend, man. He he uh but uh, uh I'm he was part of that group at Southern. Too. Oh, you know what? Right. It wasn't the Du Bois book. It wasn't the South. It was maybe one of the right, other. Yeah. Uh, the uh, right. That's right. It was the Du Bois book. Uh, yeah. and, and and he was an intellectual historian. And he and people like and said Samuel Du Bois Cook like oh. gave gave money to defense funds to keep me from going to jail. So that was great. <laughs> no, but, but uh, I didn't mean to take you away from. So you say UNC was just as important as AU. Well, yeah, because the moment that I went there was like a moment. Uh, in the midst of campus ferment, right? It it was just before, it 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 was in that instant, like between the free speech or the anti speaker ban movement and the civil rights protests in Chapel Hill, uh -huh. and the emergence of the of uh, the anti war movement, right? So I was there just at the beginning of that. Um, I was part of the group that sort of took over the campus in AACP chapter and rechristened it the uh, the black uh, the black student movement but uh, but this was also a period in north carolina when uh you know because of the north carolina fund which was the only one of the ford foundation's 13 i think gray areas projects that was not in a big city uh the north carolina fund funded um community-based organizing of poor people in the state of north carolina and and in the late 60s, uh, I think North Carolina was probably the most organized st state in the country like that. We had poor people's organizations in every major city. Uh, and they were mainly you know, organized through a group called the Foundation for Community Development, which was one of the spinoffs of, of, the, of the North Carolina Fund. Howard Fuller, who became Owusu Sadaki and then went back to being um, Howard Fuller, was like the key you know, lead Black power, uh, what an organizer in, in the state. My good friend and comrade uh, Jim Jim Lee, who was also a few years ahead of me, was right up there with him. So, like this was like um, a set of institutions that was there for young people who were inclined toward political activism to to engage themselves with and to develop through. And and another one, just to sort of queer the story a little bit. Um, uh, the uh, the UNC campus YMCA w uh, uh, became a central node of the intake for a cohort for an age cohort of radicals around the state, 
because it was run by a woman named Anne Queen, uh, who's an older white woman who had been a mill worker early in life. Uh, at some point, there was a significant intervention in, in, in her life. She went to Berea College in Kentucky, and then I think was the first woman to graduate from the Yale Divinity School. And she was kind of a social justice, you know, they call her now, what an oriented person. And she was just a conduit for, so through her, the why, like in addition to being a case where where every student could get their checks cashed for free, uh, was what, what was a place that ran programs and like institutions that brought us in. Uh, one central one was what was a group called the Youth Educational Services, which was a tutorial project. And that drew me in and drew in people like Nelson Johnson over at North Carolina A&T and, and a bunch of others of us from around the state. So Nelson Johnson from the A&T 4. Uh, was he from no, the A&T 4? No, 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 I'm trying to remember. Maybe not. Maybe he's, he comes right after that. I, yeah, yeah. But but we're going to take oh, a oh, uh, oh, 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 right oh. Oh, oh, right. That A and T four. Yeah, uh, yeah. He definitely comes after that. He comes. Okay. Yeah. No yeah. question. No question. But yeah. but but I do want to. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, mm -hmm. you've kind of led us into, particularly in chapter three, as you talk about how folks are trying to make sense of themselves. I assume this is mm -hmm. the period when you interact with the Lumbee Indians and and these oh, these, oh, yeah. these, these categories of <laughs> rape just kind of melt away, and people have to scramble and decide what they're going to do. <laughs> and class really is beginning to emerge. And you say, like your boy says, once these race barriers have fallen, we have the more intractable questions of class right. we had not wanted to deal right. with. Uh, right. We'll be back in a second uh, on the other side of this break with Professor Adolph Reed Jr., his new book, The South. This is The Black Tape, back in a second. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're gonna talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Back at the Black Table, Greg Carr, Black Star Network, joined today by Professor Adolph Reed Jr., uh, author of his most recent book, of course, The South, and Professor Reed, you you had us in North Carolina uh, mm -hmm. when we we left, and and you really began began to narrate how the black white paradigm begins to melt away in the wake of that legislation, the Civil Rights Act of sixty uh, sixty four, the Voting Rights Act of sixty five, mm -hmm. and in the seventies, this convergence of different folk, different ideological positions, postures, different races, uh, you really force us to confront the fact that most people will try to do what's in their best interest and they're just going to mm -hmm. use the reality they inherit and the frameworks in which they inherit to try to do that i mean they're just navigating in circumstances and how mm -hmm. how were your experiences how how should we use them as a way to confront some of this kind of essentializing mm -hmm. impulse that we see in today's politics well yeah well, that's a good question i mean like my dad uh yeah my dad always said that the that that the greatest general in the world is general hindsight right because he's never lost a battle <laughs> and i got smarter about this stuff at, at, at as it receded in the in the historical uh, in the rearview mirror um but yeah like i mean that's what people do I, I, and i mean um peter novick like the historian in in in, a, in in a very powerful book called the holocaust in american life argued against the Goldhagen thesis and like other people who have contend uh, who've contended that um, that ordinary Germans bore a responsibility for not doing more to rise rise up against Hitler. And of Novik's point, which I clearly took to heart, is that if you set heroism uh, as as individual standing against the tide, right, mm -hmm. as a standard for being a just or a decent person, then you've stack the deck, right, to make everybody horrible, right? Because what most of us do most of the time, all of us do some of the time, um, is adjust our senses of self, our aspirations, how we view the world, 
in relation to what we understand to be the limits that we come up against. And it's a different point, but I'll say this, like this is one of the problems with progressive or nominally, well, frankly, the way I've been saying it lately is whatever that formation is, it occupies the space that the cultural space that a left would occupy if there were one in the U.S. And right? you the left really, for all intents and purposes, what are we even talking about? Yeah, no, nothing. But but that's not there. And I think that's something that 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 yeah. it would do us well to face up to. But but one of the big problems with whatever that uh, amalgam is out there is that being a progressive or a leftist has come much more to be a statement about oneself, right, right, about how one sees one's identity than it is about a pragmatic commitment to transforming the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And to and like there are a lot of factors that feed feed into that, like the whole uh, you know, NGOization of the movement, I think, is one of them, certainly, and a big one. But to the extent that that's the case, then that means that people are more committed to an understanding of who who they are and and what they feel and seeking that as everyone does right to some level to harmonize. And this is something else my dad often said about ideology. He described it as, in one sense, the mechanism that harmonizes the principles that you want to believe that you hold and what advances your material interest. Right. <laughs> And 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 we all tend to do that. And see, I think among other reasons, that's that that's why it's so important for us to be part of collective processes. Because I don't trust myself, mm -hmm. right? Like, what I'm, none of us can, not really. Well, no. I mean, without absent some type of group formation. In fact, I want to ask right. you about that because right. you write about why you're in South Car uh, North Carolina, rather, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Soul City, Floyd McKissick, and you make an right. interesting observation that some of the class interaction between mm -hmm. whites and blacks there's a more there's more of a comfort level based on class right. than there is race. And I guess that mm -hmm. that asks, that leads me to a question as it relates to race. Um, mm -hmm. And you as, a, as an organizer who spent a lot of time organizing, you know, when you say that, for example, black folk really have no obligation of group loyalty and I'm not going to single out black folk. I don't know mm -hmm. if there's any right. folk who do that. Right. Um, is there anything to be gained in trying to cultivate a sense of group loyalty beyond shared oppression? among black folk and how do we do it uh for those who are in the working class or the poor um, right well yeah that's a good question too i mean yeah yeah the group loyalty th th thing is interesting right in this sense people belong to multiple groups and see this is what like well, like the straight race line wants wants to deny i mean from the from the time that I first encountered uh, Patricia Hill Collins's work in the late 80s and what was to become later or, or not much later uh, when I'm, um, I, I, intersectionality, what what struck me was that the account goes like um, men, men have particular experiences as men, women have particular experiences as women, blacks have particular experiences as blacks. Uh, et cetera. And I mean, heterosexual people have have a particular experiences as heterosexuals. And then in Collins's account, anyway, the punchline becomes, therefore, to, to understand the situation of a black woman, you got to be a black woman. And my question was always, well, why? Why is that the last stop on the train line? Right? I mean, what, what, what keeps this way of, of thinking? from going going all the way to the radical subjectivist view yes. that no one person can adequately uh, you know, understand the experience of any other one person because every individual is gonna be like a snowflake in that sense. Yes. So there's solidarities and solidarities, right? Um, and I mean, um, race in Barbara Fields is um, great um, in, encapsulation has always been um, a mechanism of symbolic camouflage or, or superficial camouflage over political economic dynamics and hierarchies. Like I'm working on a chapter now yes. uh, where I'm comparing um, the commitment to white supremacy on the part of the um, of the lost cause ideologues in the late 19th century as a way of, uh, as a means to imposing a ruling class program, 
right? Yes. To to our contemporary moment, where on the part of some of the people who are who want to focus our politics on taking those 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 monuments down, and don't get me wrong, I'm no, nobody in this world is happier to see them gone than 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 I am. But there are elements out there that want to make us that make that a centerpiece of of what we understand black politics to be all about. And my argument is that those forces are pursuing um, um, a racial or a race reductionist understanding of the issue for a different version of the reason that the white supremacists at the end of the 19th century were, no, were have, doing have, it. Absolutely. And that in both cases, it, it's uh, to advance a class program. Absolutely. In fact, I, you know, I'm dying to ask you this, uh, particularly reading chapter four on passing, mm -hmm. um, where you re raise this question of group loyalty and obligations or lack thereof and individualism. You know, looking at uh, somebody like uh, Judge Jackson, J soon to be Justice Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, married to a white man. You see a lot of uh, mm -hmm. black people saying, well, he's, she's married to a white man. She isn't loyal to us. But you kind of you kind of encourage us to dispose of this notion of racial loyalty that flattens those class distinctions. And I'm right. wondering um, whether in a class analysis, uh, she might be considered a passant blanc in the sense that <laughs> it's, it's, it's passing more than just phenotype. It's right. passing also a class phenomenon in the sense, and should, uh, are we really overburdening that kind of demography based? We've got a black hmm. person on the Supreme Court. Are we really overburdening it uh, instead of doing like you, you and your colleagues were doing and really began doing in the 60s and 70s with the black politics model? Let's mm -hmm. look at our interests. What are our right. interests? In right. fact, put a blindfold on and right. ask the politicians what their interests are. I'm right. wondering, I mean, is, is is there a passing equivalent in in in, in a class? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The passing analogy, like in this respect, is interesting. I'd have to think about it more. But I will say this: that um, that um, that the race or the demand for race loyalty is often um, um, a mask over a class program. Right. Mm. Like. So, like this is an anecdote. Of course, it wouldn't make it into the book. But uh, when I moved back to the East Coast from from Chicago in the late '90s, I was on a flight back back to Chicago for a conference. Uh, well, not long after, and I flew out of Hartford, and a and, and and a black woman came came into the gate, and she looked familiar. But I thought, like I'd done a lot of flying uh, the previous couple of years, and I thought that. And I'd begun to recognize flight crews on United, so I thought maybe she was a flight attendant I'd seen before. <laughs> right. But then I realized she was Gail Gail King, who at that point was what was an anchor on Channel Three in, in uh, Hartford. And it was kind of interesting to watch because her fan fan base, which was like you know white white women from twenty five to forty five, were like gushing, of course. Um, and we're all over her. And it was kind of interesting ethnographically um, to watch her performance of uh, that combined uh, a superficial um, expression of intimacy and, and, and a regal distance at the same time. I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, but, but, but at one point she was explaining uh, you know, to one of the fans that she was going to Chicago that weekend because that was the opening weekend of Beloved, Oprah's film, right, mm -hmm. based on a Toni Morrison novel. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of stage whispered to these women that, you know, it's very important for us to see it on the opening weekend because that would help for the rating sweeps. Mm -hmm. So I sat there thinking, oh, all right. So I didn't realize that we all have an obligation to go make more money for Oprah, who already has more money than God. You know, because <laughs> we want to take a break and come back for our final segment. It does remind me of one of your uh, uh, one one line that you gave in an interview regarding the 1619 project, where you said, well, you know, I'm wondering whether or not the concern is for the political economy and the radical inequality, or the concern is whether or not to make sure that 12% of the 1% is black. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> when you say, I mean, and that that's a very disturbing kind of thing. But but let, let, let's take a break when we come yeah, back. Okay. We got our last section, uh, our last segment with uh with, with you, Professor Reed. And when we come back, we will finish up for now because mm-hmm. as you all can all see this is an introduction. We've got to have Professor Reed back on, on so much more of his work. Uh, but back in a moment with Adolph Reed Jr., author of The South: Jim Crow and His Afterlives, on the black at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? We're back at the black table for our final segment for now with Professor Adolph Reed. And we are going, when we left, we were discussing, among other things, Professor Reed was helping us begin to tease apart some of these class issues that are intraracial often in the black community and, and that are obscured. Professor Reed, and I didn't mean to cut you off, I wanted to get right into it because I know we had so much more. When you When you look at contemporary politics, and, you know, you talk about anti-racist stuff, anti-racist work that people are doing and mm-hmm. diversity, equity kind of stuff. You know, what are some of the ways that we can um, draw from our previous experiences and get some, regain maybe some of that momentum of memory from some of the struggles mm-hmm. that have been waged in the 60s and 70s and forward, trying to build an analytical framework and organize right. to kind of replace some of this. I don't even say drift. It just seems mm-hmm. like a surge toward this identity right. politics model. Right. Right. Well, yeah, uh, that's another really important question, man. And, and I mean, I think the main thing that we can learn and see generally, and I know that you're asking like a different question. No, no, generally, no, well, well, no, but, but, but when we generally, like when people ask that, what, what they have in mind is, you know, going like to the Oracle of Delphi and getting some wisdom from Malcolm right, or something right. like that, right? We know that's not coming. <laughs> right. No, no. Uh, um, and besides, um, and this may rankle some people too, but we, we don't know how Malcolm X w- w- would have turned out if he hadn't been murdered, right? You make that point. In fact, what was somewhere you wrote, um, oh no, I think it was in- uh, Stirrings. Was in yeah, yeah, that's right. It, the symbolism of Malcolm is is almost worthless in the sense that he just becomes a, a, a figure, an, an right. avatar, and it just mutes contemporary. Uh, uh, right, like those X caps, right? The Spike Lee was making money off of in the oh, early nineties. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that well. no so, so there is no oracle coming then. So what do no. we do? Well, see, see, I mean, this is how I think that it makes sense to uh, to approach history in ways to help us try to understand the tasks that confront us in the present. Mm-hmm. Uh, at, at, in the last chapter of, or the conclusion of my Du Bois book, I make an argument for what I call a generative approach to, to history or to political history in particular, which comes down to this. Yes. That, at, that, that, that at any given moment, there are a number of forces and ideas and tendencies in contention uh, in, in, in the struggle. And the struggles get resolved. They usually, almost all the time, they get resolved uh, in favor of the most powerful elements, right? The ruling class, right? Ultimately, yeah. and the rest of us make accommodations, right? But once, a, but when a moment of struggle, and this is over 
simplified, of course, but when a moment of struggle gets resolved into a new common sense, then then that becomes the baseline understanding of the nature of of things for the next round of struggle, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, my colleague and good friend, uh, Roger Smith, has a nice, a real nice essay on this called, uh, or, or, or has done very nice work on this in a number of places around the theme of the spiral of politics, how ideas, institutions, ideologies, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, mobilization uh, emerge, transform, struggle, and become a new consensus. Mm -hmm. If we understand that that's the way the history works, Right then, we can sort of see how um, the, for instance, the victories of the of the mass action, or or what I sometimes call the heroic phase of the civil rights movement post war, mm -hmm. uh, that culminated in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and and the Voting Rights Act, and for that matter, 1968 Fair Housing Act, were victories. The question was on what terms those victories were going to be institutionalized yes. and who was going to benefit and yeah. what the new regime was going to look like. Yeah. And I say this, uh, I want the audience to understand that like, I came into active politics. I came into what's generally called the movement through black power, right? I mean, that's right. I mean, that's what, right? I was 19. Yeah, the African Liberation Support Committee in the Republican New Africa, brother. Right. <laughs> right. Just to get right. it exactly. in. Exactly. Right. <laughs> And I know oh, that, by the way, explaining the situation in Angola to a white <laughs> <laughs> race is very complex, man. You crack well, me up. <laughs> well, well, I got to tell you, that was a moment. But 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 what wouldn't go in the book is that when I got back to his car, I realized that I had a joint in the cigarette pack that was in my pocket. So <laughs> <laughs> limitations that's run on that problem. <laughs> but, but the point you raised, though, I mean, actually, I actually, I know we don't we don't have much time left, but I do mm -hmm. want to just ask you about this. You said something in the New Yorker interview, which I thought was intriguing. You say, you know, perhaps democracy doesn't survive the midterms, right? And and and, and of course, you you went on to express some hope, but in that context, given what you're saying in terms of building multiracial coalitions that are along mm -hmm. class lines, working class movements. I'm wondering, there's a lot of noise on, around people who would consider themselves on the left to say we shouldn't participate in the two party electoral system we have in terms of voting today. And I'm wondering if you have any uh, thoughts about that, given what you've just said about right. inheriting a set of material realities and struggling right. within those contexts, even as you try to transcend them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I'll just preface by saying, like, you know, I spent more than 15 years of my life trying to build an independent political party right anchored in the trade union movement and, and i've never really considered myself a democrat it, it it's been a marriage of convenience for me as a, as a much as it was for them right yes. but yes. <laughs> but having said that see one of the benefits and if you don't mind like i want to plug what well, i want to plug my article on this in, oh, in please. Uh, but, but it's an article called uh, the whole country is the reichstag you can find it at nonsite.org and the shorter <laughs> version at, with, on, with, on uh, common dreams, pardon me. Oh, common dreams, okay, very okay. good. And the longer one is in non-site, but but one of the entailments of facing up to the fact that there is no no left is we have no power, we we have no capacity to influence anything, and that's why I think it's stupid and a waste of time for people to fall over themselves thinking they have to make comments about Ukraine because it doesn't matter and, and, and moreover feeds feeds into i think what i think is a definitive american pathology of thinking that we have to comment and pass judgment on whatever go, goes on everywhere else in the world hmm. that said the only objective i think there is now and this notion of get you know getting outside the democratic party to me is just fanciful right right because it's not like so you announce a new party and then people are gonna like the masses are are disaffected and, and, and they'll come and vote for you. That's not the way politics works. Mm -hmm. The only thing for us to do now, right, right, the only real objective for leftists, since there is no left, is to do whatever we can to combat the um, consolidation of authoritarianism or fascism, right? And I would also say that I'm totally fed up with, with the notion or with debate among leftists about whether what this movement is, is in the US and elsewhere counts as fascist because in my view that's a that, that's a parlor game and and 
and it, and if you're in a situation in which the question seems pertinent, then then the only real thing 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 you should be figuring out how to do is how to fight it. But I think that's what the objective is is for us now. Yes. And you know, I don't know about the midterms, right? I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I but I feel a little bit more sanguine than I did uh, um, um, uh, a few months ago. But but between now and 2024, somewhere between an an electoral sweep or an out and out coup or or putsch, I think the danger is quite quite real. That's uh, that's chilling. Um... And, and sobering, and we need to take pay particularly close attention to it. And there's so many other things I want to talk to you about. And, and, and thank you. Uh, we're definitely going to ask you back. And actually, this last question I want to ask really is something that prior to COVID, with all the tragic uh, implications of what has happened during COVID, has kind of opened up a new venue for you, just like so many of us. You have been everywhere, man, in the digital and <laughs> cyberspace, but you've got a podcast now, huh? Yes. Uh, Talk yes, about that as we got to close out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, we, we have our own podcast called uh, called Class Matters Podcast dot org, uh, where and this is like a project of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute, which was created as the um, as the educational arm of of the Labor Party, uh, and it connects with the work that we've been doing with with a small group worker led trainings on economic crisis and 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 the healthcare crisis and and the organizing work that we, we've been doing in South Carolina and elsewhere within the trade union movement. And the t- tagline for our podcast is that this is where we, we consider every episode um, what the country would look like if it were governed by and in, and for the working class. Uh, Interesting. And we've got two, 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 two in the can now, and we're trying to get a th- third one together. And, and they're available at the website. Uh, one... Um, the first one is it is a group of us talking about how how to think about what the working class is uh, and whether or, or what whether and why what working people have lost faith in government and and public goods. The second episode is a discussion with Mark Demonstein, who's the president of the American Postal Workers Union, on the centrality of the postal uh, of the postal service and the dangers of privatization more broadly. And we're trying to get one together now in public education, which will fe- which we hope will feature a couple of teachers union leaders. Excellent. This is uh, this is the important work. And even though you, you decided to uh, retire from the classroom, it seems like you did that. I know black men can't spell or women can't spell retire. <laughs> <laughs> For all your academic uh, exploits and achievements, it doesn't seem like you learned how to spell that word. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we want to thank you, uh, Professor Reed, and of course, invite you back and we'll take some time. I really wanted to ask you about reparations, but that's oh, a okay. team because we could spend a whole lot of time right. time with the, you know folks are talking about it, but I want to ask you about it. And maybe next time we come back. Um, well, uh, but thank you so much for joining us. Oh, oh, hey man, thank you so much for having me, and 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 I really enjoyed the discussion. And I'll be ready to come back whenever you you want me if we can work it out. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Reed. So uh, that, yeah, all right, man. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> make sure. Um, that was uh, that is our uh conversation, our initial conversation with Professor Adolph Reed, uh, author of the new book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. I uh, encourage you all to get it also to uh, subscribe to his podcast and to follow him across social media platforms. He's been quite busy in helping us try to figure out how to solve some of these real problems that face us today, not only in the United States, but in the world. Uh, back in a moment with a final thought as we clear the black table for the week. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is this. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for having me.
for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to The Black Table. Um, we're going to close out our conversation with Professor Adolph Reed Jr., one of our most important thinkers, contemporary thinkers, with a quote from him. Um, in, in fact, this is from his uh, book, his 1997 book, W.E.B. Du Bois and American Political Thought. I encourage you all to get this book, Adolph Reed Jr. At the very end of the book, you heard Professor Reed talking a moment ago about building a different type of politics and political theory grounded in the realities that we face. And he closes his book on Du Bois, speaking about Du Bois by saying, perhaps the key point of connection with Du Bois is his militant and unyielding understanding that the truth is made under constraints and not as its agents choose, but made nonetheless. And the actual boundaries of possibility are knowable only through challenging them. Adolf Reed has lived his life to date as a model of that, exactly that type of work. And we want to learn from him and continue to learn from him and think through how we can make the world we want to live in by confronting the world as it is that we've inherited. So join us again next week at the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr on the Black Star Network. And we're very excited about all of the Black Star Network shows. So uh, join us again for this and the other shows on the network. See you again next week.